I think if I were a new instructional designer coming into Open SUNY or any other system, I think some of the first things you need to learn are one, your school culture and know your politics and you know, it's making sure you know who, who you need to talk to for decisions. Then what I think you need to do is make sure that you are asking questions. It's whether it's out to the uh, ID listserv or whether it's coming to the conferences, uh, it's the, the summit and CIT for that networking because we have a wealth of knowledge and experience in doing this. And that information base, that, that knowledge base that, that is sitting there for you to access is incredible and there's not a a week anyway it's that goes by you know it's where somebody doesn't say something that still just astounds me and you know it's, it gives me either an aha moment or a why didn't i think of that moment and so i, I really think you know it's ask your peers because most of us have been there and i think we're overall a very friendly group uh, it's, we might be gruff and sarcastic sometimes, but I, I think all in all, we really, it's, we're all here for, for the students and the way that we help students is by helping faculty and making sure that it's the best experience it can be for all of us. The first advice I would give is that don't rely upon formulas for designing courses. Work with the instructor and in the situation where it's the instructor who is actually designing the course along with the instructional designer's assistance, find out what the learning activities that the instructor believes are effective in the classroom. Find out if there are ways to implement and modify those learning activities for the classroom. Surprisingly, a lot of instructional designers don't focus on learning activities. Okay? They, they, they focus instead on assessment or they focus on content. But it's the learning activities that the students, the learners, actually have to benefit from. And if you can associate learning activities with learning outcomes and the assessments with learning outcomes, then you have some empirical evidence that the design is working. So getting, inst getting instructional designers to focus on that link, that association between the learning activity, the student learning outcome, and the assessment. Uh, is one of, I think, one of the keys to success in an online design. I try to start by talking about learning in general. And, you know, I talk about, well, you can really break teaching down into three things. You introduce content. You get students to interact with the content. And then you assess whether that interaction was successful or not. And so then I talked to them about their on-campus class. And one of the good things that we've worked into our policy right from the very beginning is that you, and we, this may change now, but when you teach, when you go to deliver a, a course on can, online, you have to have taught it on campus first. So I, that's where I start. How do you present content? What are all the various different ways in your on-campus class that you present content? And what are all the various ways that you have students interact? What are the activities you do in your class where they interact with that content? And what kinds of assessments do you use? And then I go back to those columns and I say, okay, so this way of um, introducing content is not going to work online. So we can talk about other methods of introducing content and then we can talk about other ways of having them interact. Um, yes, you can have small groups online. So if you say that one of the ways you have them interact with content in an on-campus class is to get them into small groups, we can do that. And you know, so they're, sometimes they're surprised by that. And then th I think the trickiest part is um, talking about uh, authentic assessment online. And maybe one of the biggest challenges for an instructional designer is to get a brand new faculty member to agree that maybe their objective multiple choice test isn't going to be as effective in finding out what they know on, in an online class. That's the tipping point 
if you can get them to um, understand that assessment is going to really change, then everything going back in that process starts to make more sense to them. And I love doing that. I love working with faculty because they, they get to that point and they're like, oh, you mean I can do that? Oh, well, that sounds interesting. Well, how do you write a discussion question? Right. So, and when I, and I love talking to them about discussion because a lot of faculty think that discussion in, in class and in on-campus class is like a diversion, it's kind of a waste of time, uh, you can't really assess it, and that's all, that's kind of true in an on-campus class. Um, but online it becomes the way you present content because the students present it themselves. The discussion also becomes the way they interact with the content and it's also an assessment tool. So it's all kind of all in one. My philosophy is that faculty need to be extremely familiar with the way the course works and the way the course design works and what the pedagogy underlying the course design is uh, in addition to being their own content masters. So I don't really like for faculty to use canned content or uh, publisher provided content. I prefer them to pick and choose their own content and develop the learning activities to engage students in that content themselves. We usually have them start from scratch and work through the process of creating the modules and the learning activities and mapping the assessments to the outcomes, the student learning outcomes and so forth. So just some key principles about online teaching and the way to design a course, you know, clean course design, a lot of engagement. Um, one of the first things I did when I got my first full-time instructional design job was to do a, a, a student needs evaluation to see what they were lacking, what they wanted more in their online learning experience. And one of the main things they want is engagement, they want interaction, especially with the teacher. They don't want to feel like they're just a number, it was kind of like a direct quote, or that they don't want to feel like they're learning from the computer. So they want, they, that's one of the major things we hear with online learning is students feel isolated a little bit because they're working from home, they're not coming to class every day. So that's one of the major themes that goes into my course design is how to get them involved, how to build a community online. So the faculty will come to me with their existing syllabus and a lot depends on the quality of that existing syllabus because if they already have um, well-articulated learning objectives that are observable and measurable and assessments that match those objectives, then we're, we're well on our way to transitioning online. However, if the initial design is not as strong, then we have to backtrack and talk about instructional design regardless of what medium it's delivered in. Um, but assuming that the objectives are clear and measurable and the assessments match, we then start talking about the learning activities and frequently what happens is that faculty will come with a misperception that they won't be able to do online the same activities, learning activities that they do in the classroom, which of course is not true. Most of it can be done online with the possible exception of labs and clinicals and things like that. So the first thing is to open their eyes to the fact that these things can be done. They're just done in a slightly different way. And so I'll give them examples uh, that are similar to their examples. I will also ask them what are their concerns about these activities and I'll try to give them some research-based information um, that helps alleviate their concerns. Uh, and then we'll start brainstorming ways of actually transitioning the online, uh, the, excuse me, the face-to-face -face activities to online. So when a new faculty member comes in, it's, we actually have a process on our campus. So they, that actually has to come up through their department chair, their division associate vice president, and then those names come to us in instructional technology uh, as faculty who are going to you know, come into cycle, teach for the first time online, or we're getting a new course from a faculty member. Uh, in either case, they, uh, it's a brand new faculty member actually goes through a training cycle and we put together a training cohort where it's partially online, it's asynchronous online for a lot of the content delivery now. And then we also have uh, synchronous meetings with me as the instructional designer. It's so that each 
faculty member gets more individualized. Uh, it's one-on-one -on -one support because a lot of faculty, especially their, fir their first time through, they aren't necessarily comfortable with doing all of the interaction online either. It's, and in terms of changes that we've seen, I think faculty are coming, we are getting more faculty in now that have had experience as either they've come up through their own degree programs. So they've been online students now. It's, and I think that has probably led to a, a really big change in that. So once a faculty member gets on the list for teaching online, it's we start up a training cohort uh, for it, whether we've got two faculty members or whether we've got uh, 50, uh, which would be a problem I would love to have. It's, and so when we get into that training, uh, it's, and I actually start working uh, it's within that first uh, two weeks uh, of that training cycle, it's they need to have a meeting with me, either face-to-face, -face, by phone, by collaborate, it's however that is, it's actually kind of a one-on-one. -on -one. And one of the ways that I, I help them keep calm and kind of approach the process is really to focus in on what is it that they do now? And what is it that they feel they really bring to their course? It's, and to make sure that for each faculty member, that's a little different. You know, it's one might say, you know, it's, you know, it's one might have an extensive background. Uh, some of our criminal adjunct faculty, for instance, you know, it's have been trained at Quantico. It's, and things, you know, it, and that level of experience is something that's incredible to bring into an online experience because they have the stories, they have the anecdotes that can really set the context for the content. And because of that, I, I think I, I always try to find that, that thing that the faculty member is actually really proud of in their teaching. It's so that they can stand themselves out so that their, their course is theirs, just like it would be if they were teaching in the classroom. And we say, what are the interactions that you have in your classroom that you think are really successful? Don't worry about how we're going to get them online. Don't worry if you can get them online or if it'll be hard to do. Just what are your interactions? What are your interactions with content? Oh, they read a book. Oh, they watch videos. Oh, they might, you know, go and do research. Oh, they interact with you. Oh, there's, they talk to each other. Oh, there's quizzes. So we list those things across the top of the matrix. We list the topics down the, the left on the, um, for the rows. And we say, all right, here's your roadmap, and this is what you're going to fill out for students. And we'll start filling this out as we learn new tools and what you can do. And by week five, you'll completely blow it up and start over. But here's, here's how we're going to start um, thinking about it. And, you know, that and the other article we give them is the old Educause article from 2001, Mind Over Matter, about a course management system does not tell you how to teach. You know, it's just an aggregate of tools. And it's like teaching social studies where English used to be taught, bring in a different book, move the chairs, right? So this, these are just tools, and the more you know about them, the more you can do. The main challenge I think we always present to faculty is to say, students can acquire this content-specific knowledge from almost anywhere. And if you're really just presenting a scenario of read the book, do these quizzes, read these PowerPoints, my challenge to faculty is what value are you adding to students learning? It's a confrontational question, but it's meant again to really challenge faculty's assumptions about what their role is in facilitating learning. So the outputs hopefully of a course where we've challenged faculty to rethink their role as an instructor hopefully will result more in student-to-student -student interaction and, and meaningful faculty to student interaction in that course. It doesn't necessarily have to be a replication of lectures, but it can be targeted individualized feedback based on assignments if that's appropriate. I don't know how a campus can go out and really redesign courses or even bring on new programs without an instructional designer because they're bringing in the perspective of what, th what they provide is a faculty member the opportunity to think. Right? A lot of times we're all taxed with having to get our, uh, our, our tasks over with. 
So an instructional designer can sit with a faculty member and say, okay, why do you want to do this? And why are you doing this? And what are the learning outcomes? And does it match the resources that you have? And so a faculty member really thinks, it's almost like uh, a lot of times you see a lot of reverse course design because they've had these courses for a while, they stood up, and an instructional designer now is working with a faculty member to help them rethink their course and redesign it. Where the librarian comes in is we provide them with access to content because libraries pay for so much content that's out there. We would like our faculty to use that. I've been through it. I've taken online courses as um, associate level. I took uh, my entire master's degree I took online and I'm finishing up my doctorate this summer and that was online. So, so I've been through all of these uh, different stages of being an adult student in every possible scenario that you can imagine. It's, I lived it. <laughs> so when I go in and, and I've got that perspective, okay, now when I'm looking at a course, whether I'm teaching it or designing it or um, you know, directing a team of people, I'm thinking about the student. I'm always thinking about the student and what is, what is the perspective, that, what's that experience gonna be like for them? Right. So while I definitely am concerned about what the faculty's experience is going to be, my concern is through that faculty member, how are we impacting the student experience? Right. So that that's definitely has, a, um, has an impact on how you look at things if you've been there. I think honestly, it's the best way to train a, an instructional designer or anyone that's, that's working with training faculty is to be on the other side of the trenches and, and having all those ups and downs experiences in the classroom. Um, it's one thing for us to say, here's all these technologies, here are these pe pedagogy strategies, it can't be that hard, go do it. Versus actually trying it ourselves and being like, wow, this is a lot harder than I thought it was. Um, so I think being able to learn about things and study things and research things in my day-to-day -day job in, in IT and then actually being able to have my own kind of testing grounds in my classroom has really, it's given me a lot more respect and understanding for faculty, of course, but then it's also provided just kind of a great outlet to, um, you know, have some of my own medicine. Like if, I, if I'm going to get up there and espouse that this is a great technology, this is a great, you know, best practice, but I don't really believe in it or I haven't really tried it myself, I lose a lot of credibility with, with faculty. There, I'm, just, I'm sure you know um, faculty can sometimes be resistant to um, people who they get the feeling they're incredible or they don't know what they're talking about or, or if you haven't been in my shoes and you don't know what it's like. So I think really having that experience helps me become a more effective instructor in my classroom but also gives me more credibility as a trainer as well because I can help, I can just identify a lot better with uh, the people I'm working with. So one of the things that we're constantly doing is it seems like training. We're training on all sorts of things lately. Um, so that is that is one direction. Right now, uh, our our team has gone through Quality Matters training. Some of them are still completing that. And so they're learning a lot of those best practices and a lot of the new research through that. So there's, there's an updated rubric that just came out which at that rubric is always based on best practices and research. So they're getting some from that. The other thing that we try to encourage the designers to do is to um, doing things like attending conferences and presenting. Um, every single one of them is encouraged to do their own research as well. And so we have a lot of people who are trying to do that uh, within our institution. So a combination of uh, being encouraged to do their own research, get involved with special projects that are beyond the scope of what we normally do, um, and, and to be able to take additional trainings. They've done a lot of training on web accessibility recently. Um, we have a lot of larger projects that are happening such that are outside of our, our normal day-to-day -day duties. So we have uh, two Coursera MOOCs that we've been running. So instructional designers have been involved with that process and they've learned a lot from that as well. Um, we have uh, some competency-based stuff that we're starting to work on. So again, we've been able to have some of the designers get involved with that. When I'm working with new faculty, or even long-term faculty it's, that have been doing this for a long time, and we're trying to figure out the right technologies for them to use, it's, there, there are a couple of places that I often recommend for them to start. And 
I of course have some of my own favorite websites for you know, it's those sorts of you know catch-alls and and reviews and things like that. One of which is makeuseof.com. It's but that doesn't work for everybody. So usually what I'll tell them is to start with their peers. So listservs that they have, professional organizations that they have, you know, it's send out, you know, it's ask other people. Yeah, you know, it's what what are you using? Because again, it's often more meaningful coming from other faculty that they know that are in their discipline. Or I'll I'll otherwise try to hook them up with other people that I'll know from across, you know, it's the open SUNY community. You know, it's, I happen to know, you know, it's this instructional designer at this campus talked about this, you know, at, at the last conference. So we'll, you know, it's, let me see if they have a good faculty member for you to talk to. And I'll try to make those connections for, for faculty, or I'll, I'll spend a little bit of a time trying to find kind of those curated resources for, for faculty. And I think that's one of the jobs of the instructional technologists or the instructional designers to help faculty members find those resources that will make sense for them. It's not just content wise, but technology tool wise. And so that the faculty member can go out and then find what will, you know, things that make sense for them to try. There's no question that the technology is shaping the classroom. I think to say that it's not is to just kind of be resisting the inevitable. And I'm not one of those that says, okay, we need to just embrace all these new changes overnight. It's clearly the best way to go and, and just have an equally narrow-minded view about technology being the savior rather than, you know, tried and, and true traditions in the classroom. But I think, again, it's that kind of level of being open-minded to accepting some of the changes, being aware of what's, what other people are trying and then picking up on those best practices. While we can always be looking forward to and, and researching and, and trying to stay on top of, it's important to not treat it as this kind of cure-all. Um, going in with a healthy dose of skepticism is, is I think gonna be beneficial for everybody involved because the last thing you wanna do is get really excited about a new tool or website or technique, give it to all your faculty and then see them fall flat or be frustrated with it because it's not tailored to their specific needs. So what we try to do instead is say, okay, here's a couple things that are out there. Whatever you're interested in, let's have a conversation about how this applies to your class and your syllabus and, and everything you are wanting to pursue. And then we can move forward going that way. So in terms of technology really outside the LMS that we see faculty working with now, it, I. I see probably three different kind of scenarios that are going on. Of course, more and more faculty are using either with or in conjunction with their online class, they're using more publisher stuff. You know, it, the, the MyLab stuff, the Cengage stuff, the McGraw-Hill stuff, um, which depending on the faculty member, they integrate more or less with the LMS. I think we see a lot of faculty incorporating more outside tools. It's things like iPads. It's, or, or considering those sorts of technology, it's hard technology. It's so that you know, it, they are addressing the needs of students who are working with those sorts of devices or actively encouraging those sorts of devices. It's more uh, it's recording on the student end, uh, video recording, video editing. It's those sorts of things, more actual screen captures, more you know, it's actually show me how you're doing this sorts of things which are really kind of enabled by tablets and touch screens. And lastly, I think there's that set of faculty who are now becoming more comfortable and familiar with outside tools. So it's, you know, it, they will actually use something like a blog or a wiki that's outside the LMS it's, and actually use that in terms of making students 
publicly available and more publicly accountable for, for what they're producing. From our standpoint, we try to filter out a little bit of the noise since there's so many options and say, okay, of all the web conferencing platforms, we've narrowed it down to these three. If you want to join us in our pilot program, try one of those three. Um, it's usually, we find that that's usually the case for helping institute kind of community-wide change. Like when we want to decide on the best web conferencing platform, rather than us just kind of do our own internal testing, we open it up to a pilot program. What I think makes an excellent faculty development course, one, it has to be when the faculty member needs it. You, know, it's, you can't do faculty training to teach online and then not teach online for a long time. It, so it has to be near to the time that, that they're actually going to teach. Otherwise, they, they forget it by the time that they actually get to doing it. And it's just too far removed from the practice, which leads to probably the next thing. They, they have to do what they need to do to develop their course. So wrapped into whatever else you're giving them in, in terms of the content and the theory behind teaching online, you actually have to have them doing it. And just like with, as you're trying to get across to them, you, you need to model those things that make for a good online course. So chunking your material, uh, it's having meaningful assignments and real things to do that then build on that theory and, and show that they can, that they understand and they can apply that theory that, that has come across. So they, they need to actually be building out their course during that course development process. It's, and that training that, that they're going through is really just a guided course development process, I think. And that is what I've seen with, it's either our faculty, those, those that actually buy into it and, and follow along really well end up being very successful. It's faculty who have come in from other schools and said, well, I've taught online someplace else and you know, it's, we, we still go through our process. They're, the feedback in general has been, it, for the most part, wow, there was so much more that I didn't know. And it, it's just that process of going through step by step and helping them eat each milestone along the way content assessments, management of the course, you know, it's each step, letting them actually do the work to add those things in, into their course so that they're getting that feedback along the way. We have a 12-week training program for anybody that wants to teach fully online. And um, we have um, sort of made it into a hybrid, but you could take it fully online if you had some synchronous sessions. Uh, I have. Uh, fantastic colleague who does a lot of the technical uh, explanations and builds some voice presentation tools. There's some really great, um, the Collaborate suite, we've got some great tools there. <clears throat> and she has been handling the part we call the skills section, and I handle the concept section. So they have a face-to-face -face class, it's two hours a week. Um, we build a course a lot like the SUNY model. It's pretty much based on the SUNY model and it adheres to a lot of the same SUNY standards. We work with community of inquiry. Um, we find out about their discipline. We try to make it very specific to their discipline, but not sacrificing you know, the basic you know, solid uh, theory. And mostly face-to-face, -face, they want you to show them what buttons to push. And what we try to do is we say, well, you can push this button, or you can push this button. But in order to decide, only you can decide, but in order to decide that, you kind of have to know how people learn. And you know, if you do this, well, they're gonna have this experience. And if you do this, they're gonna have this experience. Which of these is more pedagogically appropriate for your students? So we don't start with the pedagogy, we start with the technology and ask them to and, you know, become informed with the pedagogy to make the right decisions for themselves, for their discipline. And all the courses are very different. It's like, I want you to make your course. You know, well, let's learn this till week five. At week five, you're just gonna blow it up and you're gonna just ignore my template, but you will have learned all these different parts 
and now you are going to just take off in your direction and I'm here to help you. We'll bring in your special tools, your math tools, your stat tools, your um, whatever it is that they're doing, the computer simulations. The most difficult thing about my role is helping faculty envision or imagine what it will be like when they're actually in the online environment. So we can uh, give them information about research-based best practices. We can give them coaching as far as course design, navigability, accessibility issues. But it's still hard for them to grasp the environment itself and how that's going to be different from what they're used to, which is the traditional classroom. So what I've found is that the best way to get that across for them is to put them in an immersive environment. So we do a, an online training where the faculty are my students in an online class. And my hope is that by putting them in that environment, uh, they are able to see some of the frustrations that online students face, some of the anxieties that students face, and that really goes a long way toward helping them understand why it's necessary for an online instructor to be more articulate, more deliberate about what they're teaching and how they're approaching that teaching. When we set faculty free into the wild to teach their course, it is not goodbye, good luck. Uh, there's an expectation that we will be having regular check-ins with them to see how things are going. And more importantly, we're actually looking over their shoulder uh, during the course. If we're monitoring the course, if we detect something where perhaps there's um, some unclear issues for students they may face upcoming in the next unit of work, for instance, we'll probably take that opportunity proactively to say to the instructor, you know, we might want to try to fix this in terms of these assignment directions before students get here. Or it may simply be a reactive approach of, ah, yes, you see, your students are saying they can't see the exam because, in fact, you closed it early. So let's talk about how we actually manage due dates uh, and access dates on an assessment. So there's a lot of regular check-ins that occur with faculty throughout that first term teaching, uh, as well as then a debrief at the end. How did it go? What worked? What didn't work? What do you think you'd like to change next time? So it's that consultative process that continues on throughout that first term teaching.